don't want to forget to push the record button. I've done that before. So yeah, yeah. So this, this is all looking marvelous and we can hear Excellent. you and see you and uh, all is well. All Thank is goodness well. for that. <laughs> I know. I, as, I, as I was saying to Terry, there's been some times on my end, but for some reason, I, I just don't even know why, that I've had to um, reboot my computer. And I think it's because my, my, it's, my computer is getting too old and it just gets too full and too tired. Um, but um, this is great. It's all working very well. So Good. Uh, yeah. yeah. All right. So we have uh, about seven minutes or so. People are starting to come on in. So, folks, we will um, officially start uh, at 3.30, and I'll do a very brief introduction. And um, in the meantime, if you want to go get yourself a quick cup of tea, or I've got myself a bottle of water, um, that would be that would be wonderful. Also, I'm going to tell you that this evening we um, have uh, the option of closed captionings, which is marvelous. I'm uh, thanks to the DHH folks for making that possible. Um, so, if you do want to put on the the closed captioning um, at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and I'll say this again, but I'll say it now for those of you who are already on, you can click the CC closed captioning button and they will start to caption once we, I'm assuming once we officially start the, the webinar. So there you go. Um, I'm gonna put myself on mute for a couple of minutes and then we'll come back um, in five and go. Okay. So I'm just going to tell the folks who are on um, the Zoom this evening, if you've, um, oh, there it is. It's, oh, there's it's captioning is on, on. yay, um, that, or this afternoon, it's not evening yet, it feels like it, I've been up since four, I'm tired, I'm sorry. Oh my God. Uh, well, that's, poor me, I should quit, yeah, let's quit whining, um, that um, you're going to see a little bit different uh, interface because we're with this has been set up as a webinar this evening usually I just set it up as a meeting it will still have good functionality um, you'll be able to hear everything um, I won't have to go in and mute you if you're talking <laughs> which is kind of nice on my end um, and also you won't have the option to put your video up however you still do have the option to connect with us via chat so um, please feel free to do that and I will, um, I will monitor the chat so Nicola doesn't have to do that. Yeah. Sit as Alberta Education on the oh, chat. And for me on the chat, I'm Alberta Education, not Kathy Howery. I've changed my name today. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, good. Um, so I was going to say, Kathy, that um, I'm hoping that there will be time for questions. Um, but if there isn't, if people wanted to. Um, perhaps email their questions to you. Sure. And then you collate them and send them to me because of course I'm going off to Japan so it'll be quite difficult to answer them and I may have to wait till I come back. But I'm very happy to, um, to take questions and I will definitely get round to them. 
lovely. That's perfect. That's perfect. So again, um, when we, when we um, actually, I'm just looking at the time. We're still a couple minutes away. I'll say some of those things. It'll be a little bit of a rep repetition. Yeah. Um, okay. Oh. So it's quite late here. Mm -hmm. What time is it? It's 10.30. Yeah, that's I thought late. it was a little later than, yeah. yeah so not, you, uh, that's not bad. That's not bad for me. I think you and I travel in different, um, I, I, I'm, a, I'm definitely a bit in my bed sleeping by 10.30, but when you wake up at 4.30, it, you know, that's the way the world goes. So. Well, I am, I am normally, so I wake oh. up late and I go to bed early, but um, well, I thank can, you for staying yeah, away. I can, for us now today. I can get a second wind in the evening. That's great. That's right. I wish you to admire my Lady Hale T-shirt. Oh, beautiful! So tell me, Lady Hale. Tell me what is that? This is really important. So if you look up Lady Hale, people, yes, yes, you will discover why I am wearing a Lady Hale T-shirt. So okay. she was the judge at the Supreme Court who delivered a very, very phenomenal uh, decision to our parliament. A I do of. know about that decision, actually. We've heard a <laughs> thing or two about what you all are up to over there, I have to tell you. So for yeah. those of you who don't know, um, I think you should, but Nicola's in the UK and we have heard a thing or two about some of the uh, festivities. <laughs> <laughs> you well, that's, that's one way of putting it. But I must say, it's really wonderful to have a grandmother um, like Lady Hale laying down the law, all power. Well, seeing as I'm now in those ranks, I couldn't agree with you more. Yes, yeah. we all need grandmothers to take over once in a while, don't we? Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. All right. Well, I see the clock on the wall is telling us that it's time to begin. So um, welcome, everyone. Um, I um, am very pleased to introduce to you Dr. Nicola Grove. Um, Nicola and I have not met until, well, we, yeah, we met about, yeah, a few months ago, and we became, I, I kind of say, fast friends, fast, really, really fast. Um, I first heard Nicola speak at an AAC, uh, the AAC Institute about a year and a bit ago now, and she gave this wonderful talk, uh, uh, very similar to what I, she's going to be doing for us today, on AAC and uh, manual signing, and I thought, oh, Ooh, I have to reconsider some of the things that I have been um, saying. Um, so it's been wonderful to have her um, challenge my thinking. I love when my thinking gets challenged to help me remember some things that I think I knew. And then I'm also going to put a plug. I think you're going to put a plug, but I'm going to put a plug in for her new book, which I bought. And you can see I've already got it stickied and stuff. So um, we're really in for a treat this evening. Nicola's been in the field for a long time and she like a few of the other folks that I have we, that we brought to our webinars lately come from the European perspective I want to say which is sl not slightly which can be significantly different so than some of the ways that we consider AAC communication and children with disabilities in North America so uh, Nicola I'm not going to talk anymore because we want to hear you um, we're very happy to have you here uh, this evening, tonight, this afternoon. Um, and so with that, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. And thank you so much for putting this on. And thank you to all of you who've joined for this webinar. Um, so uh, just to say that I hope very much that there will be some time for questions at the end. Um, please do make a note of your questions. If there isn't time or if you don't get round to it, if you can email your questions to Kathy, she will collate them and send them to me. And I promise to answer them when I get back from Japan in about a month's time. I can't promise to do it when I'm walking the Nakasendo way, but there you go. Okay, so um, this webinar is really designed to raise awareness of the very critical role played by the manual modality, gesture and signing in the communication of young people with developmental disabilities. And I'm speaking from the perspective of some 40 years 
working in the field, both of signing and of AAC. And um, after about, uh, it was kind of two and a half years, I think, solid work, but quite a few more years in the preparation, um, I brought out uh, this book this year, which draws together, it is the first ever textbook to draw together findings from both sign language and from AAC to look at what we know about manual sign acquisition in children with developmental disabilities. So quite a lot of the references in this paper, and again, I will send Kathy a list of all the references that I'm using, come from the book. So what I want to do in this seminar is, first of all, let's have a look at where we are at the moment with signing and gesture. What is going on? And then how have we got there? And then what do we know and what can we do about it? And I'm planning to address some very practical questions because I'm a speech language pathologist by training. And so like all of you, I want to know, well, what should I actually be doing when I get into my classroom or my clinic tomorrow? Okay, so let's start by looking at um, what we know about um, what AAC says about what AAC is. What is AAC? And it's clear that AAC certainly on the surface when you look um, says that unaided communication including gestures is something that's important. Now I want to introduce you to Ricky. So Ricky's a little boy that I actually met this summer. He's a four-year-old who is the son of a friend of mine, um, his grandson, I should say. And they were very concerned about him and um, asked if I would just come and very informally just have a chat to his family and meet him. So I went along um, and spent uh, a morning with them. And sure enough, this is a little boy with a rare genetic condition, which means he's got delayed language and delayed speech. And his speech certainly wasn't very clear. And I talked with him and I got him involved in doing a bit of storytelling with me and a puppet and telling a story that I told him to his mom and dad who hadn't heard it. And it was quite obvious that he was a child who was using gesture pretty effectively um, in order to compensate for some of his difficulties. So then his grandparents took the boys out for a bit and I sat and chatted to the parents and I said, so, okay, so what's going on here? What's the speech pathologist telling you um, that you should do? And, and what, what are the reports like? So I had a look at the reports, not a single mention of gesture. Then I asked what the, what the speech pathologist is advocating and she says, oh, well, um, She's given me these little drawings and I have to get them out and look at them with him. And um, we use these prompts to get him to produce three word sentences. And I said, well, how does, how, how's that going down then? How's it going? And she said, well, we really hate doing it. And the reason that they hated doing it is because they felt that it was highlighting all of his difficulties and he was just losing confidence. So I said, well, um, what do you think he's good at then? And they looked at each other, these parents, and they said, well, we think he's very good at gesture. And I'm afraid at this point, all my professional neutrality deserted me. And I said, you know what? I think he should just put those pictures away and just work with him. Use a lot of gesture yourself, learn some signing, reinforce um, value what he's good at at communicating. Um, and I gave them a few other suggestions about how to involve him in kind of ongoing conversations and so on. And the result has been that a couple of weeks ago, I had an email from them saying, this is a changed child and he's so much more confident and his speech has improved by leaps and bounds. Thank you so much. Well, I didn't feel that I had done anything very much, quite honestly, um, but it was astonishing to me that a speech therapist in 2019 can take on a child like this and make no mention of gesture, 
and not think about how to use gesture as part of her total intervention package, which of course can include some picture description and symbol prompts as the means of improving this kid's ability to get his message across. Well, we've got a lot of Rickies and uh, a lot of you will know them. And it's apparent that we've, a lot of these children are actually quite naturally using sign and gesture. In this much quoted study by Binger and Light, I'm assuming that deaf children are involved since there are around a third of them using sign languages. So, how have we got to this point? Why is it that gesture and sign are not as recognized as they should be, in my view? And I want to look at the history of these two fields of research and practice. So bear with me for a bit. Um, In the 1970s, it was manual sign that was really one of the first augmentative methods, if you like, that got used with adults and children with developmental disabilities. And at that point, it coincided, in fact, with the rise in studies of sign language. And I had the huge privilege, because I was working with the Makaton charity at the time of which, more later, Margaret Walker, the founder, had developed keyword signs with kids and adults with intellectual disabilities. And she sent me off to these sign language conferences, which was amazing and meant that I came back with a very, very good grounding in what sign language was about. And we were able to use that knowledge to inform the way the charity developed. And it's been highly influential in my own work. And at that point, it was actually very common well, not very common, but it was common to see some references in research papers to the use of sign with these populations of kids with developmental disabilities. So autism and intellectual difficulties, excuse me. If we stick with sign language for a bit. So um, as the whole situation evolved and it became apparent that sign was indeed a natural uh, language that uh, had linguistic rules that structured it. Um, then it became very central to the way that deaf people saw their identity uh, and their culture. Um, interesting, by the way, that Manitoba seems to have been one of the first places to acknowledge signs as an official language. Um, in 1988, I think. Um, but Ottawa, I gather, in 2019 is still wondering whether to go ahead. So you can see that it's, you know, there's still really quite a long way to go. But um, by and large, sign languages are now accepted as official languages. Uh, a lot of this happening in the early 2000s. What about AAC? Well, I was in at the beginning of Isaac as well. So I went to those early Isaac conferences and to many other conferences and research symposia in the 1990s and the early 2000s. And I wrote a lot with the group of European researchers, including Stephen von Tetschner um, and uh, Kaiser Launen and, and many other colleagues. Now, um, signing at the beginning of Isaac, there were a lot of papers and a lot of interest on signing. It was viewed as uh, an unaided system of communication, as it still is, um, but it certainly was on a par with, or regarded as being on a par with aided communication. Within the 1990 taxonomy developed by Lloyd Quist and Windsor, um, signs are therefore viewed as unaided AAC systems, and of course, they are always used in conjunction with speech. On the sign language side for the deaf community, the sign systems, not sign languages, but where sign systems were used as a way of teaching spoken English, 
this was found to be really quite inadequate for the education and language development of many deaf children. And these systems came to be seen really as kind of quite oppressive in positions by the dominant hearing culture. So you can see that we have a split happening in the way that signing is viewed. Then, of course, we have the rise of the digital age this century and in the years in the last 20th century. Universal access to communication technology and communication technology seen as providing a lot of solutions. It must be said for the sign language community as well as within AAC, because uh, many of you will know a lot of fabulous sign language programs with avatars and ways of learning sign language and so on, and presenting it indeed. So um, the situation that we have now, I think is where in terms of values and attitudes to what signing is, the two fields of research are really very separate. I would almost go as far as to say that we're looking at two silos. On the deaf side with sign language, deafness is seen as difference, not disability. Signing as a language central to identity. And on the AAC side, signing seen as a compensatory mechanism for people who have some kind of expressive disorder, which is effectively a deficit model. So it's not surprising really that we have this great split between uh, what in effect looks to be the same phenomenon, which is the use of the hands to communicate information. In the real world, of course, things are much messier. So in the real world, it has always been the case that some kind of form of signing, keyword signing, very similar to what you see in AAC, has been recognized by the deaf community as a form of a contact language between deaf and hearing communities. And uh, right from the start, this was recognized and written about by people like Paddy Ladd, um, describing it as a form of pidgin. It is now described as a, a contact language. We've also got a number of populations um, increasing awareness of populations where, um, again, the signing is going to look more like keyword signing, or you've got populations where there is going to be a need for some form of communication technology. Uh, and I would mention here these children who don't seem to be benefiting from cochlear implantation, the populations of children who seem to have language delays and disorders, uh, hearing children of deaf parents who have developmental disabilities but who are developing sign as a first language. That's work that's been done by Bensi Wall and myself looking at um, Down syndrome children and others who are first language signers. And then we have our population of individuals who are both deaf and intellectually disabled. And this is the group that I think are really losing out. Certainly in the UK, I don't know about in the States or in Canada, but um, here in the UK, um, intellectual disabilities is always viewed as the primary disability and it kind of trumps deafness. So I've certainly come across children who are profoundly deaf and intellectually disabled who are not being educated in deaf provision but who are being uh, educated in hearing provision because they're regarded as intellectually disabled and their deafness is therefore secondary. And what that means is that their language is not developing and they are exposed to very inadequate models of sign language. Um, certainly one child I came across in my own clinical practice in the 1990s, but another one um, just six years ago, I observed in a classroom. So, looking in a little bit more detail at AAC interventions, um, clearly these came about 
through the recognition that speech training doesn't work. But I think there's a bit of a problem with the term AAC, something Kaiser and I talked about a lot when we were writing the book. Because most users are operating in the hearing world, um, the very term augmentative and alternative suggests, well, alternatives to what? Augmentative of what? Which means that effectively speech is viewed as the default modality to which we should all be aspiring. It's also been the case that um, I think right from the start there's been um, so much interest in technology. So a lot of the, the drive for setting up Isaac came from manufacturers and innovators who were very excited by the potential of technology for solving some of these communication problems. And it was interesting to go through a time when AAC users were re-described as a AAC consumers because they are people who buy products. That's not the case if you're a signer. So what you can see is a kind of tilt towards aided communication. I would also say, and you can challenge me on this if you like, but um, I'm thinking way back, and I don't know if it's still the same now, but I think that high status in the field of AAC has historically been associated with people who had physical disabilities and intact cognition, uh, Stephen Hawking being the obvious poster boy, which again means that you've got a kind of... Um, bias, if you like, an inbuilt bias towards interest and value of people using aided systems. And what all of this has meant is that inadvertently, I think, something has happened which I call the sign decline, a gradual marginalization of sign and gesture in the field of AAC. Certainly far fewer research papers, and I provide the figures for this in the book, um, I think one of the factors impacting on this has been a great respect for deaf culture and sign language and a, an anxiety about cultural appropriation, um, which is quite fair enough, really. So it's perhaps not surprising that within AAC, we tend to look at sign language and say, oh, that is something totally different. That's not something that we should be getting involved with because we don't really know about it. Our population is different. But more worryingly, I would say that signing an AAC has again, traditionally and historically been associated with the predominant out group in society. That is the people with the lowest status who are people with intellectual disabilities. And I'm drawing here on the work of Chris Goody um, from his work in um, 2015. And what we find now then is omission of sign and gesture from exactly where you might expect it to be as a speech pathologist. So I'm Looking now, and I only did this just for this webinar, actually, I didn't know what I was going to find, but I thought, I, I just want to have a look and see how do Asher define AAC? How is Isaac currently defining AAC? Well, both of them clearly are mentioning in the base definition, unaided systems. You can see it there, aided or unaided, uh, eye contact, sign language, facial expressions, touch. But as soon as Isaac gets more specific, you can see that it kind of defaults to talking about AAC as equivalent to aided language. Uh, there's the same thing actually on the Communication Matters site in the UK. And um, so I'm interested here that Creating an aided language environment is seen as critical, but there's nothing there about a signing environment. And I don't quite understand why not. ASHA on their website 
have a page about a comprehensive assessment of AAC. Remember Ricky? Remember how in Ricky's report there was no mention of gesture? Well, it's perhaps not surprising when what you see here is that what is recommended is that if you, as a speech pathologist, are doing an assessment of a child's need for AAC, you look at what symbols are they currently understanding? What pictures are they looking at? Are they using pictures and communication? No mention at all of manual sign and more worryingly perhaps, no mention of gesture. I would also bring in here what I think are very significant attitudinal barriers. Um, so uh, we don't want to be known as a signing school is quoted by Stephen von Tetchner, um, a mother who had wanted her child taught signing who wrote to him. This is from some years ago. So you might like to think that things changed. Uh, I actually overheard at an Isaac conference um, two speech pathologists talking to each other Signing makes them look funny, so we don't encourage it because it would make them stand out in public. To which, what I wanted to say, but I didn't was, well, you know, when they talk, they sound pretty funny as well. So are you stopping them from vocalizing and speaking? Perhaps you'd better sellotape their mouths up because, you know, you wouldn't want that happening. But just this year, I heard about the social worker telling the mother of a Down syndrome child, oh, it'd be better not to teach her signs because, you know, it'll stop her speaking. And um, I came across this paper by Schaefer, um, which is quite an interesting paper looking at the acceptability of different forms of augmentative and alternative communication. The highest rated, unsurprisingly, was an iPad with speech output. But I think there are real ethical considerations in doing what was suggested, in fact, by that paper, that we should be using public acceptability or public acceptance as one of the criteria that we employ when we're thinking about uh, which resources we should be supporting. Um, for a child with developmental disabilities whose speech is not affected. Okay, so what I want to do now is to look in a bit more detail at what we mean by uh, keyword signing. And I'm going to do that by starting out looking at sign language um, and then um, gesture, what we know about gesture and what we know about keyword signing. Sign language, of course, natural languages of deaf people, as we've said. Lexicons differ, but um, grammatical structures, quite different from those of speech, but seem to be have some commonalities uh, across languages using topic comment structure, simultaneity, spatial grammar, as those of you who are working with signers will know very well. What do we know about gesture? Well, uh, I'm taking most of these findings from uh, the chapter by Laura Sparacci and colleagues in my book. Um, it's important to note that although we are focusing here on manual modality, actually linguists now see gestures as being vocal as well as manual. So exclamations like wow or, or ouch um, are vocal, seen as vocal gestures. And originally in sign language research, there was um, quite a push to distinguish gestures very firmly from signs, language from non-language, which wasn't surprising given that what sign linguists were trying to do was to advocate for the status of signing in the face of considerable skepticism from um, prominent language researchers who were a bit incredulous that what looked like a very pictorial, apparently simple system of um, gesture, in fact, was something much more complex and sophisticated. However, nowadays, um, 
it's recognized that actually the relationship between gesture and language is much more dynamic and fluid and creative. And I recommend a paper by Susan Golden Meadow and Diane Brantari, um, which lays this territory out. So here, um, what I'm doing is just introducing you to three forms of gesture and see how they're used in signing. So first of all, there's simple dexis, that's pointing. Um, so obviously that's something everybody does as a gesture. I point to something that I want. In sign language, points take on a pronominal referential role. So they can be used to indicate people or places, um, but they also within the discourse will be used to refer to a preceding topic or reference. Representational gestures are those ones that we know very well that arise spontaneously in conversation when we need to explain ourselves or we can't make ourselves heard. So um, that's where there is a clear form meaning correspondence. So I might say, can you find my bag? You know, um, no, no, not the little one, that the big one. Um, oh, I was... I was walking down the road and there was this bus that was just going like this. Um, these, it is now recognized, are the basis for the generation of signs and for new sign forms. And then finally, there are those um, gestures which have become conventionalized and culturally accepted so that their status is equivalent to words. So that would be something like drink or good or this gesture, which I gather is now an outright trope. How did that happen? Can we please reclaim it? Um, and um, we know that iconicity plays a, a role in signing and can be quite important in sign learning. So those are the different types of gesture and how they may be used in in sign language. How did gestures develop? Well, gestures are so critically important in language development. In fact, children's gesture use, as we know, seems to be um, correlated quite closely with their later achievement. And manual gesture use emerges pre-verbally and is very high amongst two-year-olds where it's very common to see gesture and speech coexisting and um, sometimes even joint production where you get one component spoken and another gestured so i remember my own granddaughter um, looking at the book and saying pretty meaning a pretty butterfly gesture of course we continue to use throughout childhood and adulthood um, because it's so helpful, not just in um, communication, but in formulating our own ideas. There is a lovely paper by Golden Meadow, which um, illustrates how if you are giving directions to somebody on the phone, um, people often gesture uh, as they're doing it. And that's obviously not because they're communicating information to somebody, it's because they're kind of working up to themselves. So you go down here oh, and then it's uh, that way. We are real bimodal communicators. I want to draw your attention to a very important study by uh, the work of Golden Meadow, Jenny Singleton and David McNeil. This was um, looking at children who were home signed, who were deaf, sorry, home, uh, home signing deaf children raised in oral environments. So they had, uh, they didn't have sign language input, but they seemed to discover some of the principles of how a sign language works autonomously. And this would happen because they would sometimes, they would create a, a gesture of something like um, drink, um, and then they would change the form of that to indicate changes in meaning. So they might do drink, drink a lot, or drink, a, having a long drink. Or they might displace a sign to show that um, the cup is there by moving it from neutral space where it normally happens somewhere else. And moreover, 
what these children seemed to do was to introduce some systematic patterns of ordering of agents, actions, and patients in the way that they sequenced their signs um, or their gestures, if you like, their gestures and their points. So these children were creative innovators. They were children with difficulties, but they needed to communicate. And that drive to communicate led them to systematize the forms that they were using. I just want to briefly um, refer to what we know about the impact on speech of the manual modality because of um, this uh, still very, very pervasive belief that if you introduce signing, then children will stop talking. Well, we know that the reverse is the case actually. Um, and that's probably because partly of the neural proximity of the structures involved um, but also, as we've seen, um, we all use gesture and speech together and gestures and speech have a, they help one another. Um, an early study by uh, Gay Powell and John Clibbins showed that adults with intellectual disabilities who'd been taught signs and who were using signs, their speech was clearer when they signed than when they didn't. And that was the case even if the listeners could not see them signing. And definitively, Kaiser Laumann's work showed that over time, the early use of sign predicted and promoted spoken language development in children with Down syndrome. So there's definitely evidence there that you can use to back up what you're doing. What do we mean by keyword signing? What is it exactly? Well, keyword signing is what we do when we take on signs and use them to children or adults. We use natural spoken language and we will sign one, two, maybe three components. So you have options. If you've got a sentence like, put the book on the table, you might sign just one thing, put the book on the table, or put the book on the table. Possibly, put the book on the table. I'm using, of course, British Sign Language here. Um, as we've seen, you can see something very similar often in interactions between hearing and deaf people when you've got hearing people that don't have a lot of sign knowledge. So what's the process that's going on? Well, it's explained very clearly in the Isaac taxonomy uh, as a code system. So signs, it is thought, translate words at the point of transmission. So you form the sentence, put the book on the table in inner speech, and then as you transmit it, you make a decision at some level about which component you are going to sign. I'll just glance at what we know about sign interventions in AAC, because clearly they are there. There are quite a few research papers, as though, as I've said, not, not as many now as there were. So the main paradigm is behaviorist. And this is, I think, because signing is associated, as we've said, largely with these youngsters who've got quite severe intellectual disabilities. And these um, behavioral techniques are, of course, tremendously powerful. They work. Uh, they work to an extent. And they're used, of course, here with very benign intent. But the view is of the child as a blank slate who needs to be taught, trained through highly structured methods involving imitations, prompts, reinforcement, and then generalization outside the teaching context. You find that in these paradigms, there is um, a very strong focus on two early functions, 
and those are mans or requests and tax naming or comments. I I do I will just as an aside say that I find it slightly bizarre that we're still talking about mans and tax which derive from Skinner's original formulation of uh, language development. Um, you don't see it, I have to say, outside this kind of context. Stephen von Tetschner um, points out that although these may, and indeed they, they often do have a practical use, but they can't tell us how and why language develops in the child. And they don't tell us much about use. However, this situation is changing. And here are some of the drivers. It's what I think anyway. First of all, we've got these really interesting clinical populations um, developing, or rather awareness of these clinical populations where they could clearly be a benefit of the use of AAC. And these are these deaf signing children with additional disabilities that you will read about in um, Ross Herman's work um, from City University and Bensi Wall's work and Gary Morgan. So there's a whole population here, very significant population, where we in AAC ought to be working together with sign language researchers to say, how can we collaborate to assist these children? Secondly, I think the whole rise of person-centered approaches, um, where very much the value comes um, from thinking about clients or patients or uh, children as active contributors to their own rehabilitation, valuing self-advocacy, identity and actualization. And alongside this, I think there is real continuing evidence that many children, including many children with autism, may show distinct preferences for signing and may not want to use aided communication or not at least in all contexts. And we'll come to that later with some specific examples. Thirdly, I've been very excited in writing the book and discovering the work of Annalisa Kusters and Charles Goodwin. Um, these new semiotic paradigms for thinking about communication and multimodality. Multimodality, not as something that is the result of a kind of very linear coding system that is inflexible, but something that is dynamic, creative, and responsive to the moment. And this seems to fit with what we know about children signing which is that it's highly context dependent and that the communication environment and communication partners play a really, really important role in actual use. The third driver is that I'm afraid children just don't do entirely what you expect. So firstly, keyword signing may describe what we are doing when we sign to the child, but it certainly doesn't seem to describe terribly well what the children are doing when they use sign. And um, just in doing the research for the book, uh, myself and Charlotte Parkhouse and Gareth Smith did what I think is some really exciting work with kids with intellectual disabilities using sign to debate in, uh, in group situations, which I'll describe in a minute. So what do we know about use? How do children who've been taught signs actually use them? Well, there aren't an awful lot of research papers on this, but it was something that really interested me as a speech and language therapist um, because I'd been working for the Makaton charity. So the first piece of research that I and Sheena McDougall did was to go and look at 49 kids who'd been taught signs in special schools and we looked at them in class and when they were playing with a peer. 
And what we found was that children who, in classroom situations where the focus was on teaching them signs, looked to be very high signers, that is to say the ratio of intelligible signs to intelligible words that they produced showed that they, they were better at communicating in sign. And some of them would be quite consistent with that over different contexts. But with most of the children, their signing varied depending on what kind of context uh, they were in. And in that study, in subsequent work by Judy Buchanan Mellon, and in Ellen Roberts's work in the Netherlands, it's become absolutely clear that there is a positive association between signing by teachers, classroom sign environments, and signing by children. So, who would have thought it? If you sign more to children, they will sign more to you. And if you stop signing to them, or you don't sign to them, and they won't sign back to you. And all of this has led uh, ourselves and Ellen Roberts to suggest that when you introduce sign, it's not a tool for modifying an individual child's behavior. It's a cultural initiative that impacts on an entire environment. That if you want children to sign, families need to be signing, teachers need to be signing. You've got to have a culture that promotes signing and gesture and really values it. During that study, I noticed these children who seem to be doing something similar to the children, remember, in Golden Meadows study, those deaf children raised in oral language environments. So um, what struck me was one boy in particular, I showed him the picture from the Rennell Developmental Language Scales because I was assessing him for this study. Um, and it was three men standing at a bus stop. And instead of signing three men, he looked at the picture and he went, he was pluralizing through repetition, which, is one of the ways that you pluralize in sign. I also noticed children who just did not seem to be reproducing word order of the spoken out input in their sign output. So I did a PhD to look at it. I'm not going to go through this in detail because you can find these results in papers that I've written and in the book. But what was really interesting is that in terms of the word order, uh, quite a lot of their output did deviate. Now, it's really important to recognize that you don't find this deviation in a word order, um, a strict word order language like English. It's very rare to find word order errors. And you don't find word order errors in intellectually disabled children who are speaking but there was quite a high rate in my group. I think it was around 8%. And what was very interesting is that if you had children who spoke and signed, their speech followed the sign, not the other way around. So shown a picture or video actually of a boy eating a cake, they might sometimes uh, say and sign, eat cake, but they would also do cake, eat, and they would say it. Where is this coming from? Because it's not something they hear. Um, Martin Smith uh, at the same time found um, something similar in her PCS users and we suggested in one paper that the problem might be between an asymmetry between the input language and the output language but this has never really been followed through so we don't know. Another really interesting thing is how complex some of the output of these kids were. So I'm going to try and produce this one. Uh, so this was, again, a child describing what she'd seen on a film. And she does something like this. Walk, sit, boy. 
that's incredibly difficult to do. I suggest you go away and try it. She is saying one thing and signing something else. And uh, she doesn't do it nearly as slowly as I do either. So something very interesting is happening here. The children are not doing what I predicted they would. They also did produce some of these meaning-based modifications, and this was really very exciting. Um, what it did when these children changed the form of a sign is that it really increased the communicative power of their signing. And that was evident because the teachers who, was, who were in conversation with them um, nearly always uh, responded by verbalizing what they saw the children doing, even if they hadn't consciously noticed what it was. So here's the boy who I can see, because in another context, he produces what in BSO is the citation form, light. And he produces it rather low down, um, but he's doing it more or less correctly. He's very dyspraxic. When he's talking about his passion, which is Concord, he describes going to see Concord and his teacher says, and what did you see? And he does this. And she says, oh, you saw the lights flashing. So he doubles the sign, pluralizing it, and he changes the movement and repeats. Another lad, who's um, talking, I'm afraid, about fighting and hitting. That may have not been my choice of um, topic of conversation, but that was his. And he produces citation form hit, and then he varies that um, subsequently to show hit me, hit sla no slapping on the cheek, no punching on the nose, and no slapping on the nose. Little girl, very dyspraxic again, produces wash in neutral space and then uses the same hand shape and movement to talk about washing hair, washing her trousers, move to her hip, um, her dad washing the car. All of these verbalized by the teacher. Now you may be thinking, oh, this looks, this just looks like gesture. This is really simple. Yes, it looks simple on the surface, but when you realize that what the children are doing is taking a form that they've been taught and changing it in order to communicate the meaning and that the changes they are introducing are actually similar to what happens in a sign language, then you start to think about it rather differently. You start to value the creativity that these kids are showing. Helen Rudd, who was one of my students at City University, found that actually you could teach these modifications and you could actually encourage children to use these modifications systematically and to generalize them across contexts. It's a very exciting finding because this really does help children to communicate in a more interesting and effective way. I reanalyzed my uh, PhD data um, this summer when I got very excited by what Charlotte and Gareth were doing in their classroom with a little group of signers who they introduced um, the idea of debating to. And I looked at the, the kids' use of pointing and I looked at um, how they were um, taking control of the discourse. And uh, again, it looked simple on the surface, but what they were doing was uh, really, really interesting. They were really participating actively in the conversation. So time is moving on. So I'm gonna go uh, a bit faster and just look at uh, what do we know about development over time? Uh, Kaiser Lanham did this eight year follow-up and another child who she worked with was Eric, 
who um, we've got nearly 17 years, well, we have got 17 years worth of work on. And what's very interesting with this kid is that over time he shifts, he starts off as a dominant sign user and he starts to have many of those kind of sign features that we observed in the children that I'd seen. Um, but by 17 and a half, um, due I think to his voice breaking, he'd started speaking and sign had reverted to a more augmentative role. So um, really interesting change at the time, but signing and gesture retaining a very important role for him in ensuring that his quite unintelligible speech is more effective. Little uh, paper by Webster Town 2016, 40 years on from an autistic boy being taught by Nicola. Yeah. Something has happened to your uh, sound. Do you, you, uh, we can't hear you as well as suddenly, so I don't know. Um, just try again. Come a little closer to the computer and try. Okay. Is this sounding yeah. better? Yeah, much better. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry about that. Okay. So uh, I won't go back because you've got the slides. So um, this is a child, uh, autistic child, interestingly, who's still 40 years long on is using signs really creatively, developing new concepts in sign. David is um, someone that I saw only last week. Um, he used to be my next door neighbor in London. So I was very, um, really close observer of his communication over time. He was another child who rather like Eric started out um, as very, very apraxic although now as an adult, he's developed rather more effective CV spoken words. Um, initially, when he was little, he was introduced to sign and he was quite resistant to it. Um, he was an early adopter of aided communication, but now as an adult, he's signing more because he's in a community of peers who use signs creatively themselves. And he has voted with his feet to totally abandon his extremely expensive SGD. He just doesn't want it. Um, and then finally, this little girl, Katie, who I was told about uh, by my friend Jill. Uh, this child, brought up in care, described as severely disabled, um, went into foster care with a classroom assistant. and. Um, whose grandson said, oh, well, Katie talks to me. Well, no, she doesn't. She doesn't talk. Yes, she does. She uses her hands. And the child went on to describe how this little girl communicated with him and had developed a highly sophisticated use of gestures to refer to family members. I've never seen her doing that at school, says the grandmother. No, well, you wouldn't. She only talks to children. And the grandmother then observed Katie and said, you know, he's absolutely right. And the speech therapist was totally mortified and said, all of those years of wasted time, we gave up on her. So she's given up on us. Because if Katie realizes that an adult is watching her, she stops signing. Okay, so... What are you going to do tomorrow? Well, if we're going to assess children, I think it's really important that we do it from a really good knowledge of sign language and gesture development. I only recognized what the children in my study were doing because I knew about signing. Look at the resources that these kids are already deploying. So Helen Rudd in her intervention study found that just as with my kids and with Kaisa's um, case study, a lot of these kids were already using these sign modifications and all they needed was a bit of a helping hand to do so more systematically. Make sure that your approach is multimodal and cooperative where you're really valuing what the children are doing and the modalities that they want to use. Um, I developed um, a pragmatic assessment when I was working as a very newly qualified therapist in a special school. Um, 
and uh, Marilyn Buzelich, I know, does something similar with her communication sampling. I have to say, I'm not terribly comfortable, happy with the rather reduced taxonomy of pragmatic functions that's employed in AAC. And I personally prefer Halliday's model because I think um, it's much more um, comprehensive and definitive. So what you do there is you actually spend a lot of time observing with a taxonomy, and that will be available from my website, where you look at what modalities are being used to realize what functions in different contexts. When it comes to intervention, I think for me, it's all about maximizing creativity, regarding myself as a co-producer with the child. I'm not the expert teaching the child. I'm there to learn from and alongside of the child and we learn together. Using the principle of relevance developed by uh, Dan Sperber and Deidre Wilson as long ago as 1986, which is that, you know, if a child knows that you know what the topic is, they're less likely to explicate with their language. So typically, if as a speech therapist, I have a picture and I hold it up to a child and say, tell me about this picture, why should the child try and describe anything to me if he can see that I can see it just the same as he can? And I have to say, kids with intellectual disabilities know this just as well as kids of normal intelligence. Um, so you want to provide communication challenges that are fun and motivating, things like barrier communication games or retelling stories. Static pictures are not as good as film for signing because children presented with pictures will tend to point at them and use nouns, whereas if they have to narrate a cartoon or something dynamic, they're more likely to use verbs and verbs are critical. Bring in some signers to work with them. Children learn from being modeled, having good practice being modeled to them. Bring in those deaf actors and poets to have fun with them and help them create new meanings in signs, words, and symbols. Some of the problems that come up in my own clinical practice and have done in others are things like, oh, well, <clears throat> signing's not very clear. There's, uh, I've done quite a lot of work on this. Um, you have to know your sign phonology really well. I'm not terribly keen on modifying signs. I think it's better to look for what alternatives there are in the sign language lexicon. And I found the work of Marsha Lee Dunn on pre-sign motor skills absolutely um, brilliant as a way of working on kids' signing skills, not as prerequisites, but alongside what they're doing. People sometimes say to me, oh, well, you know, this kid, I've already, she knows 300 signs. I'm not sure whether to teach some more. Well, look at how she's actually using them. Is she really using all of those signs to their full potential? Um, make sure that there are enough verbs in that vocabulary because a lot of sign vocabularies are very noun heavy and without verbs you can't expand. And you look at Leia Dark and colleagues' um, lovely chapter on introducing sign vocabulary and how to do it in our book. Um, children who only use single words and signs, well, a good place to start is by what we know about gesture development, getting kids to combine signs, words, and points, working on sign modifications. And those word or order anomalies, well, we won't worry about them too much to begin with. Um, but if you do need to introduce um, structure, then um, using, I think, literacy techniques and symbols can actually be a very good way forward as long as the child understands what those symbol prompts mean. So where do we go now? Ha, huh, finally, if you're still with me. Well, I would really love to see the field of AAC adopting multimodality, seeing sign and gesture not as alternatives to aided forms and abandoning these attempts to find the perfect system to match the child, because that's going to change. That's what we know from these longitudinal studies and from the context variation. 
adopting co-production, seeing these children that we're working with as creative innovators, respecting and valuing their choices. Seeing intervention as a cultural initiative and focusing really on use and development over time and making sure we get some dialogue, please, between sign language researchers and AAC researchers who have so much to offer each other. I'm going to end with um, this plea from Jennifer Paul in 2017 to view signing as a human right, not just for deaf children, but for all children and adults with developmental disabilities who can and do use gesture and sign as a wonderful creative medium for becoming effective communicators. Forthcoming events, just to finish off, um, I've got a seminar on the 27th of November in London. If any of you here are listening from Britain, please do um, come along if you can that evening. The 19th biennial conference is coming up in Cancun and the call for papers is in October. If you're a researcher or a practitioner who's thinking of going, do consider putting in some abstracts on the sign. We really need them there. And finally, the Makaton Charity in Canada is now developing a whole keyword sign program. Um, and I know they'd be really, really keen to hear from you. So thank you to everybody. Thank you, all of you, if you've stayed the course. And thank you, especially to Kathy. Wonderful. Well, thank you. <laughs> that was absolutely marvelous, as I knew it would be. Um, I think it is a call to action, um, and, and the call to action is we need to work better together. Mm -hmm. um, I loved what you, <laughs> I, I don't know if I loved, um, I again was rattled in my boots to hear you talk about AAC consumers. I think that is really a worrisome thing that we have. Just this morning, um, I was with a speech language pathologist and this little monkey was just gesturing all over the place. And, um, you know, we're look, looking for the magic talking box um, when in mm -hmm. fact, really what we should have been doing and what we will do is follow his lead and his strengths, as you said. And yeah, sure, maybe we'll add some um, other approaches, yeah. multimodal, you know. <laughs> There's no problem about doing right. that. Absolutely right. none, none at all. And, right. and actually one modality really supports the other and then you increase the power of the whole thing. Exactly. So it's been, a, as I said, Nicola, you've been a wonderful reminder to me that this whole field really is about uh, multimodal communication and we uh, following children's lead uh, can only help us to hear their voices however they come across um, and, and stronger there were there were some questions um, so I know one of the things that has come up in our world is when school staff say that they choose an AAC device over sign because it's more accessible for the other communication partners. People don't understand all those signs, so we want them to talk with the device. Have you got a comment? Um, <laughs> possibly unprintable. I mean, I just, yeah, I think, I think you have to go, this is why I think the values are so important. I think you have to go back to what is your mission statement as a school? What are your values as a teacher? What is this, you know, what is this about? And, but it is, I think, I mean, I would say uh, that actually we should all be learning signs so that we can communicate with a child who's wanting to use, because the child will, David is a really good example of this, you know, this friend of mine, because he leaves his device on a train. He doesn't want it. Yeah. And if we don't respect children, so it, you know, they, they won't use devices just because we want them to. But if we respect what they are doing and value what they are doing and actually take the trouble to learn what they need, 
um, then we will see change happening. And then they might well want to use their devices as long as the system that, you know, that they privilege, that they value is one that we value too. So I think, I think one has to kind of go back to what the values are of the teacher of the school and, and challenge those. And it was interesting that looking at the Isaac and the Asher one, there is stuff in there about the ultimate goal is to do with autonomy and independence. And I think that's quite worrying because actually, as we all know now, we are interdependent, okay? We are never gonna make these youngsters independent completely. Um, it's about how we work together pro co-productively. Right. And still, I mean, I, I love that. And I think um, one of the things that, that we've been talking about, I've been talking about is give up this, not give up. We need to think about us as human animals who are interdependent on each other. Exactly. Who would ever want to be totally independent anyway? Absolutely. It's nonsense. But Absolutely. to have the child, have the child have a sense of agency and have their autonomous voice and and yeah. come through but we can help them in so many ways to do that yeah. so beautiful um um i am going to pause to see if anyone else i'm hearing there's lots of people going thank you thank you marvelous um it was great Absolutely. thank you so much um anyone else have any questions that you want to ask nicola or otherwise because i know it is late and we've kept you up late um if you want to send me some questions or comments, as, as uh, we said earlier, um, I will um, send them off to Nicola and we can perhaps have another session with her or certainly have a way to answer some of your questions. I think the more that I'm in this world, the more that I see we have to do um, uh, interprofessional practice. We mm. need to come together on all kind, you know, all kinds of. Oh, repeat, repeat the title of the book. Um, so that's another reminder. We need to work together. So thank you. Um, here is the title of the book. Again, I put it into uh, um, into the uh, question. Um, piece before it, manual sign acquisition in children with developmental disabilities. Um, maybe we could do a book study, people. That might be fun. So anyway. Hey, yeah. So thank you. Thank you for your oh, wonderful no, thank talk. You. Um, I do hope that's been, because, you know, it's very difficult when you're just this end, you know, uh, thousands of miles away, <laughs> just talking at a screen, because uh, I was hoping that um, it was coming across okay. So I, I, it's an enormous privilege, really, mm -hmm. to be, be working with you. And I really hope that we can keep this dialogue going because I think it's so, so important Absolutely. Um, for the population that we're working with. So, and I know that the Isaac call is coming up soon. So if anyone wants to talk to me about that, I'd be happy it's to the, help support that. <laughs> it's the 15th. It's I October, know, I know. I have a October list of things. The, that I it's do. October the 15th. And I would so love to see a keynote or a symposium or something that actually raises this because I just think we're now going, what worries me, I tell you, is because I think AAC is now sidelined as a field in semiotics, all of that work with Annalisa Custis, she's done with sign linguists. She doesn't even mention AAC, but yeah. why would she? She doesn't know anything about it. Yeah, why I know. Not? It's time to come together again to get those conversion paths, and I couldn't agree more. So thank you, thank you, my friend. We will be in touch. Have a wonderful time in Japan. Thank you all thank you. for participating. Thanks to all of you very, very much. Okay, good night. Bye bye now. Bye. Oh.